The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. This episode is brought to you by Australian Retirement Trust, a fund that's more super for you and your clients. With more than 2 million members and over $200 billion under management, they have more access to super smart investments at home and abroad. They're committed to working with over 4,000 advisors and delivering a world of investment opportunities to help your clients live the retirement they want. Visit australianretirementtrust.com.au forward slash advisor. Include Super Savings and Q Super FUM and members at June 2022. wonderful XY community. This week, I am interviewing Richard Felice. He is a partner at Ballet Advisory. What struck me about this week's conversation is the sheer humbleness that Richard has. He's built a dynamic, really interesting business over the last couple of years. We talk about the growth of that business, the pivots he's made, the value of mentorship and understanding your niche client. Enjoy. Hi, Richard. Hi. I'm excited to have you as today's podcast guest. We're going to talk about your business today, and we're going to talk about quite a big pivot that you've made in your business. And I'm genuinely fascinated about the changes that you've made. And I'm going to say up front, I don't know a lot about what your new world looks like. And so I'm hoping that today, both for myself, because I'm nosy, but also for the XY community, you can help us learn a bit more about the changes that you've made, why you've made them, and I guess the benefits or impacts to both you, your business, and your clients. But before we get into all of that, for the people that don't know you and your business, would you mind by sharing a bit about your story? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to do it, and thanks for having me. Look, my, my career started um, at a place that many people know, Count Financial, uh, way back when Barry Lambert, the founder of that business. Mm-hmm was the chairman and I joined that business as an undergrad. I was still at uni and studying and um, kind of decided what I wanted to do. Uh, so I joined Count and spent spent the rest of my uni days there, which was which was a couple of years worth. Um, from Count I joined one of Count's member firms, which was a business called MBT. At that time it was a privately owned business and um, I joined there really uh, once I finished uni to, to really kickstart my career. Um, as I said, that was a privately owned business at the time and I, I think I think I kind of always knew that I wanted to be a business owner and, um, and, and take my career in that direction. What happened a few years into my role there is that business was sold and ultimately became part of a listed entity. So Sort of found myself uh, mm. working for for a mid tier listed accounting firm, which was which was fine. Uh, we had some great mentors in that business who stuck around for a while. But you know, ultimately, what happened there was uh, my now business partner Sid and I were really starting to work on a certain type of client, but we felt that that client we were working on and, and the brand we were building with that client really was getting lost in a, in a big business. So 10 years there in total, we decided that it was time for mm-hmm. us to move on and, and really become business owners, what we, what we both sort of set out to do. So we, we left there and, and that was the, the, the establishment of Ballet in 2018. And, and really mm-hmm. it was all about the brand. We wanted to work with founders, executives, family offices, um, and we were really excited about that. And, and, and that's what we do. We stay true to that, and we've kind of got that business now where 
where we are business owners and have an element of control and, and all the headache that comes with that, of course, but, but equally mm-hmm. have built and can build a brand with, with the clients that we really enjoy working with. We're going to talk a bit more about the clients specifically as we go through today's chat, but from what I remember, you moved from Count to not only your own business, but did you not set up your own license? Yeah, so so the timing of our departure from from um, that business that was in BT, uh, essentially we resigned and two weeks later the Royal Commission kicked off. So fortuitous in some mm. sense, but kind of made us really realise what was important to us and our clients. And um, self-licence was, was a big thing to take on, but we felt, well, we left that business that started the way to be in control and just with everything going on, we felt like being mm. self-licensed was really, really critical for us and certainly important for our clients as well. And look, I've got to say that's that's probably the best thing that we've that we've ever done um, in, in that context. I, mm. I just think it was it was really transformational for us. Um, again, it, it was tough and it, it was a lot of time and we learned a lot. It was a, a really steep learning curve, but uh, really, really important to us and our clients, as I said. So, yeah, we, we sort of, I mean, the timing wasn't great by any means. As, as I mentioned, it was Royal Commission. We were going to self license. I've just had my second child. Um, my business partner, Steve, just had his first and was getting married. So, it was kind of just stuff all over the place really but um super stressful and a lot to work through at the time but really really happy it wouldn't change a thing where we stand today man to my own heart to just take on way more than you can probably cope with and then just figure it out on the fly <laughs> what much. advice do you have for some for someone who's perhaps is sitting in your shoes now maybe they're part of a bigger business and feeling like okay we, we we're thinking about self-licensing we're thinking about you know, having the level of control and autonomy and rigor that you need to, to move into that world. Do you have any tips, tricks, or thoughts for someone who's currently contemplating self license land? Yeah, look, I think you really need to identify what's important to the client with a change like that. I think self licensing can mm. sometimes be looked at as a way of getting around some of the, 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 um, strict requirements of other licensees, um, but it really needs to be about the client and that was the driver behind our decision that, okay, well, can we actually do better work, better quality um, work for the clients as a result of this and what does that look like with a client lens? Because at the end of the day, they're the people that you're mm. going to have to take on that journey and, and you need to have a pretty good reason as to why you're doing it. And a lot of the time you're moving away from the backing of a big institution to your own backing mm. of, of sorts and you want to have a really high conviction in that and so when you're sitting in front of a client, you're able to demonstrate and talk through why it's good for them. Um, so I think that's how you need to approach it. Is it good for the client and why and, and how do you get them on board? Um, and then it, it certainly does bring other business benefits but they, they're, they're really secondary to the law. You raise an interesting point around, you know, sometimes, and and maybe it's not as strong as it once was, but sometimes clients would come and there would be some comfort in the idea that it is backed by a big brand. Again, I'm not sure if that is as important as it once was, but what was your experience? Did you find that most people were quite happy with the idea of independence and autonomy from a client perspective, as you say, given the Royal Commission, or did you find that people really needed to learn more before they felt comfortable with it? Yeah. Look, we, we in full transparency, have, have almost gone um, the best of both worlds. So our, our, our licensee was Lonsdale, part of IWF, and we moved to the self-licensed version of Lonsdale, which they call Dealer Associates. So when we sat in front of the client, I think we also recognised that the backing of a big institution can be really important, not only from the client relationship perspective, but whether it be technical support or, or whatever else, um, it, it's really important. So where we found mm-hmm. the comfort and where we found that the clients were really happy to be a part of it was it was the best of both worlds. We've still got that, that backing of the big institution, but 
we, we're in control um, and we can pair our mm-hmm. own path uh, with their support. Um, and so, again, you know, for, for a number of reasons, we haven't gone on the full way, but I, I think that was, um, that was the, the, the sort of middle ground that we found to be, to be best for, for our clients. And excuse my ignorance, is that sort of a dealer services model yeah. where you pay and they provide you with back-end compliance or they provide you with the tech stuff? What does that look like? Correct, yeah. So, so you know, the two big things for us out of that is, is certainly the idea of um, institutional brand uh, and, uh, you know, rightly or wrongly, I think there's a, there is a lot of value in that from a client comfort security perspective. Uh, but also their, their okay. wizards and template, templates around um, X plan or, or software um, and technical support is really what we leverage most from them. But as it relates to other things like APLs and PI insurances and brand strategy and um, asset allocation, risk profiles, all of that, we can choose to use theirs um, or, or develop our own. And again, from our for our clients, mm. they, they want an element of control over their own affairs. And so um, having that flexibility and autonomy is really important. Mm, it does, as you say, seem like the best of both worlds. I'm, I'm keen on your thoughts. I ha- haven't asked you if I can ask this, so here I go. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the industry and the future? Do you think businesses are going to move to more of sort of what you've done, almost that hybrid approach of having their own license but using the large instos for the dealer services? Do you see that as a growing area or do you think more people are going to go back to licensee, large licensee land? Yeah. Look, I think it's going to be a mix. I think there's, there are certainly some firms that may have legacy books or, or practices that will always be with the big institution but... I think we've seen more recently the emergence of businesses that provide solely self license for licensee support. So you don't have to subscribe to the lot. You can kind of cherry pick different services or, or parts of their package to support your self licensed business. So generally, I think there has been and will continue to be a move away from the big licensees. I think there'll be the emergence of these purpose built businesses to support self-license and I have no doubt that that the, the firms that have the scale or, or first and foremost the client desire to become self-license will mm. um, and I think that's, that's showing in the numbers and very, very few advisors you speak to that have got self-license regret it um, and so I think that's, that's absolutely a, a common trend that we'll continue to see. Interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, you mentioned earlier on about mentors when you were at Count. I'm really fascinated by, I guess, your mentor journey. Can you talk a bit about how mentors have impacted your business, but also your clients? Because your story is quite unique here, I think. Yeah, hugely, hugely important. I think we're, we're um, under no uncertain terms feel that we are working with a, with a type of client that are really successful, have really high uh, standards of, of what we need to deliver on and are generally older and more experienced than we are. And as, as young guys and girls that are providing service to these, we, we need an element of experience and, and you know, quote unquote, the grey hair factor within our business or network. And so I found my old employers at MBT, the, the count firm that I first joined, really, really pivotal in in testing our thinking and not believing our own BS and really just being people that we can rely on to make sure that we're, we're keeping client focused and, and heading in the right direction. So I think it's such mm-hmm. an important business, business decision to have uh, mentors, but equally for personal and professional growth, to have people that inspire you and that, that um, you get excited by their careers to, to give you um, their time and energy. And, um, oh, yeah, as I said, I think it's really, really important. Agree. And as you say, to have someone challenge your own thinking and your mm. your BS can be yeah. extremely beneficial and so 
effective in terms of cutting out wastage of time and of, you know, money and of trialing things. How did mentorship look for you? Was it something that had a, a rigor, a cadence of regularity, or was it just sort of ad hoc? What did you do to make the mentorship work for you? Yeah, and, and I haven't thought about it until now, but when I first started at MBT, it was almost forced upon us um, to say that as part of your personal and professional growth, you will have a mentor and you will meet with them X number of times per year. Now, the asterisk there is that those mentors were within our business. If you didn't have an outside mentor, you could access access someone within the business, almost like a buddy within the business. What mm. that did was force us into an environment where we were learning and we were having open and honest conversations with people that, that had lived and seen more than we had. And I think that structure really set us off on the right foot that you, you, you don't really want it any other way. So once you become used to having a mentor, I think it's really hard to go back the other way. Um, and so to answer the mm. question, the regularity was there initially, and I think with that you form really strong relationships. And in fact, the person that was my mentor at MBT, so we're talking 14 years ago, is actually a client and still a mentor today. Um, so mm. it goes to show, I think when you find the right one, you generally stick with them and um, they, can, they can often show you the way and... How has having a mentor or your mentors specifically impacted the type of clients you work with? Yeah, good question. Um, If I had to put it really bluntly, that mentor is exactly the type of client that we look to attract. So some Mm -hmm. people place those people as chairman in the business or, um, or other types of relationships that they that they seek but yeah they are almost picture perfect the type of client that we that we look for or the type of client that we work with so again not having thought about it too much until now I think their views of the world have very much shaped what we do and how we do it and yeah undoubtedly have contributed to an element of success in attracting and retaining those types of clients. And let's just sort of help people understand, you're working with people that are really at that high net wealth, ultra high net wealth, family office style uh, level, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So our, our, all of our clients are founders, executives or family offices. Um, and so family offices is a word that's sort of thrown around a lot these days, but you know, private, private, wealthy private families um, is another another way to term it. So, to determine it, so they are CEOs or CFOs of private and public companies. They've sold businesses and done really well um, out of that transaction, um, or they are sometimes first, second, third generation of um, of uh, of wealth. And so, with that, mm-hmm. um, yeah. We've, we've sort of shaped what we do and how we do it. Cheeky question. They sound, uh, look, this is me putting my um, uh, stereotypical lens on things. They sound like an older demographic. You're a young guy. Do you get yeah. any pushback about your age? Not, not anymore, funnily enough. I, I, think, I think part of that is... There is a, there's a track record of working with these types of clients. And I think a lot of the new clients that come to see us are referrals from existing clients. And so I think the way that we attract them um, definitely has a, a really, really important part of, you know, whether it's overlooking or just reducing in importance the age factor. Um, but I think critically, as I said before, we've made it point to surround ourselves with people that are more experienced than we, than we are. So um, a couple of those people, mm-hmm. that, you know, my, the mentor I spoke about and who is a client and we look after, you know, some of his close friends and family, um, all the way through to our investment committee who, who is headed up by Giselle Wu, who 
has spent her career at Escala and, and JB Weir as the CIO. And again, I think clients are, are more comfortable with drawing good company of people they may respect or have, have the right level of experience. So I think we've, we've been really deliberate about uh, who we bring into the business and what role they play. And I think uh, that helps with the older client uh, who may be first generation. I think I think just the other part of that is a lot of these guys are planning for future generations. So so the scenario is often that there is enough wealth there to last their generation, and they're thinking about generations two, three, four, and five. More often than not, we are the age of that second generation. Um, and so when you look at it from mum and dad's perspective, there's longevity in that relationship. So we've looked after mum and dad for 10 or 15 mm-hmm. years. Um, their son or daughter is, is a similar age, who has similar interests to to us. And, you know, all of the lay look and feel uh, similar to me in terms of age and demographic and interests, and that's deliberate. And mm. they see that, you know, they don't want to deal with with um, somebody that might be your, your more typical investment advisor or accountant. They want to deal with somebody they, they enjoy working with but equally has the experience and, and care uh, to take them and their future generations forward. Um, and so I think you're right. I think it, earlier in the piece, the age piece was important and we had to, we had to navigate that. But I think as of today, um, second generation, we really feel like we're much more aligned in, in, in where we're all going. I think it's actually really rare you know, like I think the majority of people that look after the similar demographic to what you look after probably have people your age almost as successes within the business. But it's fascinating to hear that um, it's not an issue. And maybe it's just because now you've had kids, you've got more gray hair. So maybe you just look (laughs) older as well. People tell me that. Did somebody Um, tell you to say that? No. (laughs) <laughs> no, I'm joking. Like, you know what? I'm it joking. is rare. Um, it is rare, and I can tell you that because yeah. we're trying to find people um, that that are again culturally aligned to the rest of the team of Belay that have experience in working with a similar type of client, and they are very, very difficult to find. Um, so yeah. you know, that that's not by design, but yeah. We feel that's a really key point of difference for us. And even if you find them, again, something that we uh, really, really value and the client really, really values is the integration of the tax and business advisory services. And so someone that was born and raised in a similar environment to us would don't make an investment decision without knowing the tax and business consequence. Again, it's really, really hard to find. So when we talk to a client about our value proposition, more often than not, demographic and longevity relationship as well as the integration of the tax and wealth piece is, is discussed at length. Interesting. I want to talk about some changes that you've made or evolution, I guess, you've you've had within the business to look at I guess, I guess my question is, is it from an efficiency standpoint and how did you get here? But let's talk about moving away from solely the traditional, I guess, retail model to having wholesale clients, how much of your business is done through sort of a wholesale lens now and what has that transition been like for you? Yeah. um, So by the day, more and more of our business and our clients are transitioning to a wholesale relationship. When I spoke about the early days of our career, Again, just just the way it sort of worked out is all of those clients by accountant certificate definition tick the sophisticated mm. investor box. Yeah, I mean, it does bring about, I would imagine, an element of, I guess, risk for you to consider through a different lens because you aren't providing that statement of advice. Mm-hmm. So navigating a couple... Have you found sort of a sweet spot on how to do that or is that something that you, like both people have to do that suitability yeah. piece practically? What does that look like? They do, yeah. So we, we uh, will always approach it with both uh, members of the, of the couple. 
I think I think one of the the interesting things about that is that one of the trends I've seen over the last few years is as these clients age, um, it, it it starts to become a couple engagement anyway. Um, and so the clients are always thinking about succession and what if something happens to me and, um, you know, is, is my partner across all of this? And in the last few years, um, we used to meet with maybe it was just the, the, the uh, male or maybe it was just the female, but now both male and female are coming um, to the meeting. So I've got to say we probably haven't had much of an issue of working through it and acknowledging that uh, both of them have made investment decisions together, jointly signed off, um, and they're both actively part of the conversation. And given this wholesale transition's only been happening in the last 12 months, um, then, uh, yeah, we haven't really run into that as, a, as an issue. That's amazing. And I think that's a sign of the strength of the relationship you obviously have with both. So well done you. Yeah, well, yeah, either that or, um, yeah, <laughs> aging clients, they start to work out what their priorities are and we we are somebody that can sort of help them along with that, I guess. Yeah. So given this is quite a new evolution within the business, what have been the benefits? The core of our business is investment advice. Um, and so you've sort of got two types of businesses in this space. You've got your more traditional financial planning business where it is about um, cash flow and saving for houses or property or, or building uh, mm. in accumulation mode. Um, and there's a lot of strategy that comes with that. Um, our, our advice is mostly investment advice and investment strategy. And so, again, mm. when we're looking to deliver really good outcomes for these clients, I think some of the learnings over the few years is that most – Public market investments, certainly share market investments, move in the same way pretty much all the time. And so what it's allowed us to do for the benefit of the client is spend more time on private or alternative assets, um, mm -hmm. run them through our process and, again, with the support of our investment committee, and invest client money with um, with sometimes a more, more predictable but certainly a more stable um, returning mind. And I think as you run through that and, and identify the proof points along the way, we've been really, really happy with that as a decision. Um, there's a lot to that, of course. I'm sort of skimming, skimming over it a little bit, but there's a lot that mm. goes into that. Mm. Uh, but clients are equal. You're making it sound that. easy. It's not. It's not. Sorry. Um, yeah. And, <laughs> and I could bore you with the detail behind it, but, but people like Giselle in our business and more recently um, Alex, who's kicked off our Melbourne business, who, who's come out of uh, PwC in Melbourne and is one, one of the first employees of the private wealth team over there. These are the sort of people that, that really test the thinking and help us deliver on this. Um, but we've made an important point within and externally to our business to partner with the right people, um, again, to make sure that we aren't believing our BS, but also that um, we're not getting excited by returns or whatever else. It's very, very methodical. It's very deliberate. Um, it's, it's mostly with uh, risk lens and what can go wrong, and we make decisions um, on that basis. How big is your team now? Uh, so we're now a team of 20-ish. Um, you kind of, yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's about 20. So uh, and that, that doesn't include the external stuff that, that we, we call partners in the business or uh, partnerships. Um, so, it's, yep. yeah, it's kind of been a, a few years of, of um, really steady growth. And when we, when we started, the lady said we wouldn't, we wouldn't kind of um, get to being a business of the size that we are. But I, I think one of the key differences, again, that's been really deliberate is each person we hire is with a specialist skill in mind. And so it comes back to what are we delivering to the client and do we actually have somebody on board that can do this? And if not, we need to go to the market and find that person um, to help us do this properly. So gone are the days where we used to wear 
multiple hats and kind of learn things on the fly. I think each of us know what we're good at and the space that we play and we keep in our lane and, and we, we bring other people on board that are excited about what we're doing and who we're working with to, to help us expand that service. So just from a practical standpoint, does someone own, like how does it look from a client lens? Someone owns the relationship with the client from like a lead perspective and then you bring in the specialists as needed or how does that practically work for someone who's a client of yours? Yeah, so given we've got the, the, the accounting, tax and business advisory side and the wealth side, a lot of our clients will take up both of those services. So, we, so we've got a reasonably high penetration rate across both of those services. Um, so it's sort of mm-hmm. the entry point is, is um, someone from the accounting team, someone from the wealth team. Clients naturally gravitate to who they're comfortable with. Uh, the, the amount of times that, for example, Sid is asked a question about wealth and I'm asked a question about tax, I mean, you, you, you would find it comical. Um, but we sort of like that because clients aren't really sure who does what and we work it out internally. So it's not about me then giving the tax advice, but it's, it's, it's me being in control of that relationship and bringing Siri or Sid, you know, doing, doing the opposite. So I think, um, the answer to your question is nobody owns the client. The client will go where they're most comfortable and from a, from a business commercial perspective, that makes a lot of sense. And then as we require something that might be out of scope of that person, we bring them in uh, into the meeting. So we will often have two, three or four of us sitting in the meeting with a client and we, we really just work through it as, as a team. And that's the way we position our engagement is this team approach. Um, and we'll have different skills, complementary skills in the same room and, and we, we work through it, whether that's – the investment advice, whether, whether that's philanthropic advice or whether we bring somebody around succession, um, it looks and feels depending on what the client needs. And have you already met to discuss the client situation before you go into that meeting or is that meeting more like a workshop where the client sits in there and everyone sort of says their piece in terms of considerations, um, objections to each other's ideas? Like what does that look like when you're in that meeting? Yeah. One of the one of the challenges um, over the years is if the, the right people being across the client situation. So we've done a lot of work on the transparency of client information. So so many times I'll have a conversation with the client and um, you know kind of take that away and, and do my bit, but nobody else knows I've had the conversation. And then, for example, Sid comes into the meeting and. and Really, he should know that, and that's that's my responsibility to let Sid know that, so he's not blindsided in the meeting. Mm. And the client expects us mm. to all know that. We're under the same roof. It's it's often why they engaged us because there's an expectation that we'll share the information and then we're all across it. So mm-hmm. uh, through systems and processes within the business, um, we've and I can't tell you all our secrets, of course, but we, there are ways that we don't tell me all of them. I can, tell you, <laughs> yep. I can tell you some of them. Um, there are ways that we share client information and conversations um, in a way that it's sort of like a notification, so you can't you can't miss it. Um, the other side of that is we're always talking about accountability with sharing and being across the client situation. So it's up to me if I'm going to meet with the client to get across what's been going on through the systems and processes, but also talking with the key people to make sure I'm really well prepared. And again, um, you only have to learn that the hard way once to to make sure that you put the time and energy into it before that meeting. Absolutely. And I know from my old BDM days, one of the big challenges for businesses that were similar to yours in that they had that accounting piece and that financial planning piece was often they were working off two different types of technology that didn't integrate or talk to each other. And it was hugely challenging. It sounds like you've perhaps solved that from a tech perspective. It's it's not perfect. Um, this is kind of a bugbear, I think, of, of a lot of businesses in a situation. We've, we've purpose built um, a solution um, that, that okay. we, we are a lot more confident in, um, but it, it's also highly customizable. But as we um, leverage other technologies, we can integrate that. So 
as you'd expect, being you know reasonably young firm, technology is a big part of what we do, um, and so mm. part of that information sharing is also okay. Well, how do we get our software stack onto the one spot and give the rest of the team mm. transparency around not only conversations but other client information or, or you know, tax lodgements or directorship changes or or everything else that's really important um, in a business like ours. I think that the information is and the data is, is power um, and, and really, really key and um, it's not lost on us for sure. It's a, like well done you. It sounds like what you've built possibly was expensive and laborsome <laughs> and ever-changing. It was. But don't you yeah. find it baffling? that we live in this world and this is really common and yet this is still a huge problem for us yeah. to all tackle? Blows yes. my mind. It, it is just crazy. I mean, yeah, you're, I'm sure, like us, you sit there and you think, how has nobody really um, thought this through and, and invested? And I think I think that's, that's changing um, and we have had... Uh, more than a few false starts in trying to get the solution right. And as I said, it's not perfect, but mm. it's a long way from where we were. Um, but I, I think mm. I think by the day we're seeing investment into the CRM space and the integration and the APIs and everything else, and I know the guys at XY Advisor are big on that as well, but mm. yeah, it blows my mind. I feel like we're really, really behind where we should be with, with this sort of stuff. But um, I think the, the, the big players are either purely wealth or they're, they're mostly accounting. And, and so perhaps um, us smaller boutiques are, and you know, don't have a big enough voice to motivate somebody to make that change. Well, dear um, technology providers, if you could please hurry up because <laughs> it's so frustrating and it's so tiresome and confusing and ultimately it's unprofitable and costing client relationships because we spend so much time on yeah, it. Yeah. So oh, please hurry, yeah. hurry, yeah. hurry, hurry. Hopefully that is the catalyst for a change. I've got confidence. I mean, is. obviously I ask for something, Richard, and it just happens and that's how <laughs> things work in my life. <laughs> if only, awesome. if only. Um, a practical question on the size of your business so 20 is big yeah. 20 is big and you need to be congratulated because that's a you know to think of all the big life stuff you've done and business stuff you've done in such a short space of time well done you yes. i want to know practically given that you're doing client stuff who's managing the team how are you making sure that you're across all the team stuff when you've got a size that big how's that working yeah, and it get increasingly hard as the team grows. I think one of our really, really yeah. key hires has been our ops manager, Claudia, who's just taken that whole piece to the next level. Um, she's great, and, and I think I think the right person that has the care, firstly, but also the skill and energy mm -hmm. to, to get the team excited by it, um, of what we're doing and... and help us invest in their careers and everything else. Those people are really hard to find. So, I, you know, I, I'd be, I, it would be wrong for me to take really much credit at all for that. Um, so I think having the right person, and, and look, it looks like different things in each business. I think people folk, I'm a people and culture person or an operations person or, you know, everything else um, that is somewhat similar. But I think those people are really, really critical. Uh, we spend a lot of time on our employee value proposition, um, talking to the team about what, why they're here and what's important to them from a career perspective and actually holding them and ourselves accountable across their personal development plans. Somebody really needs to drive that. I mean, there's lots of good ideas, but as you know, unless you're having regular conversations with the team and they feel they're in an environment where they can share their thoughts and feelings and more often than not that's not with the partners in the business it's with um, somebody they, they feel more connected to unfortunately but that's the reality mm -hmm. um, somebody that, mm -hmm. that can drive that um, is really really critical so we're, we're lucky to have them hey you've built such a cool business I mean I could talk to you all day and just like the more 
the more I ask you, the more I want to ask you. Um, so I think we have to leave it there for the, for the interest of time. But before we do, can I ask you a couple of rapid fire questions to round out today's chat? Okay, sure. Um, I'd love to know something that you do, my dear, to look after your mental health. Uh, keep active, for sure. Number one thing. So, um, you know, our office, including myself, is a ghost town around lunchtime. Uh, there's mm -hmm. 10 rooms doing yoga, we're out for a run, we're kicking the soccer ball around, we're at the gym. So mental health is so, so critical and I think having an active lifestyle really helps with that and that's something um, I've always done and hopefully can continue to in the future. Brilliant. Do you have a piece of advice that you would give to your younger self? Um, oh, I've got lots of advice at this one as well. Um, look, I, I think I think one of the key pieces of advice is keep an open mind about where your career and where things will go. I think recognize recognize what you feel you're good at, but also be open to learning and and letting your career go into a different direction. Um, I think that um, yeah. Certain decisions in my career have been transformational to where we are today. I think, I think um, that's because I was either forced into that or just felt it was right at the time, and and, and that that pivot was was life changing. So I think know what you're good at, but also be open uh, to let your career go into a different direction. Great. What is something that's on your bucket list? Um, I, I told myself only last year, so don't laugh, that I would go to a major sporting event every year. Oh, yeah. That is probably lots of things on my bucket list, but if I can, if I can tick that off, um, then I'll, then I'll be very happy. So you don't mean just like go to the football once a year? No. Because that would be enough for me. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, something that might require some trouble. Um, so, for example, mm. the Super Bowl or, um, you know, last year we went to the F1. I've never watched a race of Formula One, but we went to the Formula One in Melbourne, um, Super Bowl, Australian Open final, Swimming final, Champions League final, all that sort of stuff. That it is, it is a, a major sporting event, not the, not the sort of weekend derby. Yeah, okay. That sounds fascinating. <laughs> Interesting. I, I no. In all seriousness, I years ago thought I'm going to go to a a, um, a baseball game in New York. I used to play softball, and so I thought this will be brilliant. Yeah. Oh my gosh! After about two and a half hours, I was like, "When will it end?" <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize how long they are. Yeah, I think that's pretty common feedback <laughs> for baseball, so I might leave that one off the list for now. Just. Obviously, this is your bucket list. I can't tell you what to put on there, but just be prepared for it to go for much, much, much longer than you would think. Um, and then last question for you is, I have a fake book club, which just means I like to read a lot. Do you have a book recommendation as part of my fake book club? I do. Um, there's a book called Legacy, which was recommended to me by a client, and I think it's just one of those fascinating books that, you probably picked up on into sports and it's actually about the All Blacks, uh, the rugby team and and how they became such a successful team um, and all the things they did from a business perspective um, around mindset and behaviours and attitudes of the team um, to get to where they got to as a, as a successful rugby team. So. Um, I really recommend that. It's a, it's a great combination of sport and, and business and, um, and, yeah, couldn't recommend it highly enough. Do you know what, what's really annoying about that? What? You're the second person that's told me I need to read that. And so I typically don't like to read sporting based business books, but given two people have now told me it's a must read, now I feel like it is a must, must read. You must. You must. <laughs> Thank until, you. Until I'm reluctantly adding it. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I just say for those playing at home, um, some people have been telling me that they've been reading from my fake book club list. So thank you for partaking in my fake book club. You too may need to read Legacy given that this is now the second time it's come up. So it's clearly bloody good. Richard, I've known you for a little while now. It's been amazing to, I didn't realize just the level of growth you've had. And so I want to say a massive, massive congrats to you. I know it probably hasn't always been easy, um, but clearly you're doing a really remarkable job. 
thank you so much for being part of today's XMI podcast and I wish you all the very best in the future. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And yeah, um, hasn't hasn't been easy by any means, but we're really really happy to be where we are, and I appreciate you having me on.